Hello and welcome to Jim Dalton's presentation on the first hour. How important is it? It's Monday, April 20th, 2015, 4.30 Eastern. We'll go for about an hour. We do have a hard stop at 5.30. Uh, we will be back at 11.30 on Wednesday for a different topic, so check out our um, website if you're interested to learn more. And uh, Jim and I want to thank you very much for being here. This is Julia Stewart. I'm a trader too and also a student of Jim's and his partner here at J. Dalton Trading. So um, thank you everyone for being here. It's great to see you after the market close uh, here to learn more. So um, with that, let me introduce Jim Dalton. Hi, Jim. Julia, thank you. Um, just to make it clear, Julia is a 50% partner. We own, we own this business uh, together. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go through the preparation for the first hour of trade. Then I want to talk. I want to go back and talk about what happened today. Um, I'm guessing that a lot of you were on the webinar this morning. Uh, we we did think that the market was very short coming in. Uh, that did play out. We had a reference, but um, we did talk about that this morning. The market did go up today. Uh, it did look like a short covering rally. We talked about crude this morning, and uh, crude uh, applied the balance rules. It uh, traded near the lower end of the two-day balance, and traded up to the opposite end of the uh, of the balance. So it did. It followed the balance trading rules uh, very well. And we talked about gold. We, we said that gold looked a little bit heavy, and possibility of a firecracker effect. It did gap lower. It did take two previous highs, uh, lows out but we'll talk about those shortly. And then I want to end up today with talking about some expectations for tomorrow and how we will prepare for tomorrow. Okay, the first hour of trade and how important is it? I believe that it's likely the most financially devastating period of the day for many traders. Uh, I am always amazed at how many times I hear horror stories of traders that got whipsawed in the first hour of trading. So many times traders are so anxious to trade that they get they get pulled in to this emotional uh, feeling early in the first hour, say, oh, if I miss this trade, I may miss the best trade of the day. There are some times you want to trade early, and there's other times that you don't. Today was a day you wanted to trade early, and the reason was we were out of balance relative to the value area from uh, Friday, but we'll talk more in detail when we look at that in a minute. But the first hour trade is likely the most financially devastating period of the day for many traders, and we're going to try and orient you towards when do you trade, when is it important to trade during the first hour, and when is it not important, when is it important to stay away. Also, the first hour trade is likely the most psychologically draining period of the day for many traders. Many traders don't give serious um, attention to the importance of being psychologically fit uh, for trading and understanding that our psychological reserve is limited just as our, as our capital is. So the combination of financial and psychological capital are the nucleus for success. Neither financial nor psychological capital are unlimited. Okay. First hour trade, is there a single factor that dictates whether or not you should trade in the first, in the early in the session, first hour? Yes, market confidence, and we will, we will talk about that as we go on. Now I want to talk about how do I prepare for this important decision, and also how do I prepare for the coming session? I always start, I use a top-down perspective. Too many traders get too focused on very narrow pieces of information, and they get blinded to see what is really important and what may really be unfolding in the marketplace. And many of these tr traders that get too focused get too focused on price rather than on some of the other areas that are important. So I use a top-down perspective, and to do that, I always start with a monthly bar. So that when I look at the S&P monthly bar, and this is what it looked like over the weekend in preparation for today, is you'll see the trend, the trend is up. We have a fairly tight three-month balance, 
April was an inside month, and um, the market is balanced. The, the market is, is balanced on a monthly basis. There's, there's, it's nothing, there's nothing more to it. So many times people are trying to make more out of the market than really exists. And this is why I start at the monthly and I look at the month, I say the market is balanced. So when it's balanced, I have, and I'm about the center of that balance, I have no advantage one way or the other from a trade location standpoint. But it's just a great thing to say, oh, okay, I'm just going to settle down. There's no great trade setting up right now. Then I go to the weekly. If there's going to be a change in the monthly, it's going to start, you're going to see it manifest itself first in the weekly. So as we go to the weekly chart, we see it's at the 10 week, a 10-week balance, and it's just slightly above the center of the 30 to 4 day trading range. And don't count the days, I may be off a day or something, but it's about the center of that range. That is an also a good perspective to have. You say, wait, wait a minute, I didn't see anything on the monthly that said there's anything, you know, pressing right now. I don't see anything on the weekly that tells me there's anything, you know, urgent or any great directional move underway. Then I go to the, um, I, I come down to the daily, uh, the daily bar. I look at the daily bar, they have a 34, 35 day trading range, and again, we're in about the center of that of that range. Um, we've had a lot of volatility down, up big big day up, down big day down up, big day down the other day. So we had and this just goes through to close on Friday. So I I'm in about the center of a 34 35 day trading range. I've had a lot of short term volatility, but I haven't had any longer term volatility showing that I'm going anywhere right now. Again, once you get this perspective, you say, all right, there's nothing big going on out here uh, at this point. I don't see any indication on the monthly, the weekly, or the daily. Now I come down and because I've taken, I've looked at the bigger perspective, I've got, a, I've, I've got that in my mind. Now I want to come down, I want to narrow my focus a little bit, and I want to start focusing on my tactical plan for the coming, for the coming day. When I do that, and the next thing I do, I go to the profiles. The profiles give me um, more of a microscopic view. Remember, the the daily bar is simply time price and and uh, time price and and uh, it's a straight line. It's basically straight lines. It doesn't give you any depth to the market. When you start to look at profiles, you start to see more de detail. It's like putting the market under a microscope so you get a better look. You'll see on the bigger picture here, and we'll get off of this in a second, we have a very prominent point of control up here that hadn't been revisited coming into uh, today. We had a big gap coming into the day. We have a prominent point of control from uh, uh, last Friday. So we're, we're looking at this. We think we, what we wrote up this morning, there were a lot of stops at, a, at the 2078 level on on Friday, so and we also didn't Friday didn't look to me like it was had much on the downside. It looked like the, the market may have been very short on the close. So now I get in and I take a closer look at the profile, and I see pro, Friday's profile. We talked about this this morning. I had five 30-minute highs all clustered around the 2078 level. Now, a lot of times people that aren't steeped in how we look at the market may be mystified by why is that important. The reason it's important, the goal of, of what we do in our educational process is to teach you to trade by understanding what the competition, who you are competing with. Who are you competing with? What are they doing? Can you take it? Do you want to trade with them? Do you want to fade what they're doing? And each, each time frame has different characteristics. For example, if we saw that we had a lot going on, uh, 
you know, on the day, on the uh, monthly bar, we may say, okay, we've got the longer time frame in here doing some fairly serious buying. And what we know, the longer time frame characteristics, they have a tendency to, to buy, they have a tendency to, to put merchandise away or put securities away and hold them for extended periods of time. We get down to the next time frame, which is the intermediate time frame. They are still long-term holders, fairly serious, but they will trade when you get a bracketed market that's swinging back and forth between, you know, a meaningful highs and lows, they will trade fairly aggressively within a trading bracket. That may be a two or three month trading range and they may be active within that range. As you get shorter, you have short term time frame. The short term time frame trades normally one to three days, sometimes they'll go a little higher, maybe maybe nine to ten days, but they'll go with very short-term swings. The short-term time frame has a lot of money uh, to trade with. They can move markets within within a fairly broad range. However, they are, tr they are traders, they, are, they do not buy and hold, and uh, they can get the herd instinct and they can get very much out of whack, just as day time frame traders do. And of course, the shortest time frame we have is the day time frame trader. The day time frame trader comes in, comes in flat, and he goes home flat. So when we were looking at Friday's profile, and I highlighted the five 30-minute um, highs clustered so closely together, I have a pretty good idea that that was short-term money. In other words, that large pool of capital um, that you know can trade fairly aggressively. And remember, these traders, some people attribute a lot more smartness to them than really uh, they, they should. These people, they, they tend to act together, they tend also to act in a herd, and they can, they can drive a market pretty strongly, but they can also get drastically out of out of um, out of position. So what it looks like on Friday is that they were aggressive sellers, and they were mechanically selling for two and a half hours at the same level. Longer term money doesn't even know where these levels are. So this isn't longer term money. This isn't intermediate term money. This is strictly short term trading money. And then they get very, finally get very aggressive and a lot of courage late in the afternoon and they start to aggressively sell this market off. So when I look at this, I'm, I'm, I think this is short term money. I think there's a very good chance that they get themselves in trouble. And as you see, it did come back very sharply late on Friday. Now, what we said is I'm looking at my tactical plan for today. I'm saying, what is going to be above this DEFGH high? More than likely, there are going to be a lot of stops, not from the day time frame, because the day time frame goes home short. Flat. The stops go home, goes home flat. I'm sorry. Thank you, Julia. The day time frame goes home flat. They come in flat. They go home flat. So I have a pretty good idea coming into today that the short time frame, which can have serious money behind them, probably has a lot of stops someplace around the 278 level. So as I start talking about my scenarios uh, for the uh, coming day, and one of the things that we recommend is that you always have at least three potential scenarios coming in for the current, for the current session. Um, one of the scenarios, we had a gap on Friday, that gap existed coming into today. A gap is a can be a indication of a change of direction. While there is no excess at the long-term high, in other words, there's no indication that the long-term market is over. However, sometimes a lower gap can substitute for having had excess at the high. So one scenario I had coming into today was that we did have a gap and that gap could, in fact, um, be the start of a move to the downside. The report I wrote for the weekend laid that out as a scenario. However, I said I thought it was highly unlikely. Jim, that that is what, yes. 
Excuse me, just to interject, the reports are available uh, for download with this morning's webinar that is at J. Dalton Trading under resources, webinars, recorded webinars. Okay, so if you look at the impromptu client session this morning, those two reports for what Jim is referring to now are there for you if you weren't at the webinar this morning. Excuse me. Thanks, Jim. Okay. And a lot of what I'm talking about right now is also on on slides. I didn't want to put a lot of words in front of you because that gets hard to follow. But the things I'm talking about are bulleted on slides that accompany this presentation that Julia had set out. So my first scenario, and we always like to have three, my first scenario was that the gap was meaningful and the market would continue on down and be the start of a uh, more significant uh, correction. Uh, but I also wrote that I thought that had very low odds. Now, that's my the one I thought had lower odds. Now I came down and we always want to have three scenarios. So I, I then started saying, um, let's look at a couple of other scenarios. One of the things, the, the blue area that you're looking at represents value. And you recall, we trade value, not price. Price is simply an advertising mechanism. And we don't trade the advertising mechanism. We trade value. Price advertises opportunity. Time regulates all opportunities. And volume measures the success or failure of the advertised opportunities. Keep that in mind because volume is going to be very important when I take you further to look at what happened today. So now, when I look at, at Friday, um, we've already talked about one scenario. I look at two scenarios. One scenario is going to be if I have acceptance back above the, um, the cluster highs at the 2078 level, then I've got a pretty good chance that I'm going to get a rally out of today. Because it's going to, the day is going to start off with short covering, and once short covering gets underway, it usually gives a tone to the day. Okay? Another scenario, if we didn't, if we didn't find acceptance above the top of the uh, of the clustered spikes, of the clustered highs, the 30-minute clustered highs, then we would be talking about um, value building below the 2078 level. We would then focus on this very prominent point of control. The more prominent a point of control is, it's the longest line we're leading from left to right. The more prominent it is, the greater the odds that the market will come back and revisit that level. So the third scenario was we stayed below the clustered highs and then the market would start trading lower and at that point in time we would see where value built relative to the very prominent point of control from Friday. So I had my three scenarios coming into the session. Okay, now with that, again, we, we remember we're talking about, we're trying to take you forward and make that crucial decision, do you or do you not trade in the first hour? And we said confidence is the defining factor if you are or are not going to trade during the first hour of trade. So one, let's assume that we would have opened right about the center or right about the point of control from Friday. If we opened around the point of control from Friday, which would be about the 2075.50 level, at that point in time, we would say that the market was in balance. In other words, it was in balance, it's in the middle of Friday's range, and there basically was no major change that occurred over the weekend and Sunday night. If a market is in balance, generally speaking, I will not trade early. I will let the market set up. I'm more than happy to sit on my hands for quite a while until the market presents some opportunity to me. Okay, so if the market tr opens within the previous day's range and particularly around the center of that range, more than likely I am not going to be anxious to trade. I will just let the market chop around, I will let it work itself out, and I will see over a period of time if it starts to give me some sense of direction. Okay? That was not the case this morning. This morning, overnight, in, overnight inventory was long. Overnight inventory was long. 
you'll notice that the overnight inventory was all above the 2078 level, which were the five clustered highs from Friday. One of the things I commented on this morning, and if, if you were there this morning, you heard it. If not, you're going to hear it again. And that is, there are, while the market was 100% long overnight, and we measure whether the market is long or short or an overnight inventory based upon Friday's settle. All the trade overnight took a place above Friday's settle, so therefore we consider overnight inventory 100% long. We know that about 65% of the time there is a counter auction to overnight inventory. So if overnight inventory is long, more than likely, at least the odds are about 65% of the time, you're going to get a counter auction to correct that inventory. We also know that if the market doesn't correct that inventory, that is usually a very positive sign that the market is going to trade in the direction of overnight inventory. Friday we came in, overnight inventory was short. The market didn't care, and we got a big day on the downside. Today, overnight inventory was long, and the market didn't care, and we got a move up early. Now, the next important piece of information, people get confused on this. I, I said there were more than likely substantial stops around the 2078 level. And then the question people ask, well, were those stops, were those people stopped out and did they cover overnight? So is, is the uh, short inventory corrected because of what happened overnight? My answer is no, because very often the traders do not carry stops into the overnight market. They only use their stops in the daytime market because they know there's a lot of craziness overnight. So when I look at this this morning, and what we talked about, it's more than likely you're not going to go down much this morning because there's so many shorts from Friday and they're going to be forced to cover. And you're going to see that's exactly what happened. And we'll go to that. We'll go to today's profile in, in just a few minutes and you will see that. So again, you have to understand the context to have some feeling of what may happen on the opening. If you look at the report I, I wrote over the weekend, and it is available, you will see that my orientation was pretty heavy towards the fact that the market was, was short and that all we had on, was on Friday was liquidation versus liquidation is old business, and usually that is not lasting. More potent would be new business, which would be new money, new money selling. New money selling, you would have had more elongation to the downside. You wouldn't have had these uh, clusters around the 2078 level, uh, you would just ha you'd had more steadiness on the downside, more elongation. The fact that you didn't indicated that we probably only had um, uh, liquidation, probably short-term money, and probably a pretty good sign that the market was caught short from Friday, particularly how low this was. There was the low, there was the point of control. This is also what we call a 45 degree line. A 45 degree line occurs when the point of control is substantially higher and the market continues to trade off. Now what does that mean? The green line or the longest line reading from left to right is the point of control or the fairest price at which business was being conducted on Friday. As the market traded off Friday afternoon, Traders are getting short in the hole, and this is the common term. Short in the hole means that traders are selling short below value. Value, or the fairest price for the day, was the 2075.50 level. Traders were selling all the way down to 26 to the 2064 level. So late Friday, traders were selling short in the hole or selling below. Whoops. or selling below value. So we, we call this a 45 degree line, and it's usually an indication that the market is short in the, in short in the hole. So every indication we had this morning was that the market was short. Now, do you trade early? 
we traded within Friday's range. We opened within Friday's range. However, we traded out of it fairly, fairly quickly so that the market was out of balance and this was a morning that you needed to trade very early. Okay, that's, that's the kind of process we go through every single day. Trading, is, trading itself is not linear. However, the best you can do for yourself is make your preparation for each day linear. Set a routine. Go through that routine religiously, taking it a piece at a time in order to give yourself a fighting chance and to stay objective on the market. Okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to go out of this and I want to go to today's profile. There is, as we said, the market opened within Friday's range, but it quickly traded out of Friday's range this morning. So the market was out of balance, out of balance to the upside. When the market is out of balance, out of balance to the upside, you want to trade early. Okay? So this morning was a case in point where you want to trade early. Now, the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to walk through um, I'm going to take a fast look at crude and gold, and then I'm going to go through and talk about preparation for tomorrow. Julia, let me take questions on what I have talked about so far. I know there's probably far more questions than we can reasonably answer uh, because we do have a hard stop today uh, because one of us has an appointment. But go ahead and give me a couple of questions on what we have addressed so far. Okay, great. Thank you, Jim. One comment, too, about options expiration. This is the time that they settle up. It's settling over the weekend from the monthly um, options expiration on Friday. And we had this comment in the last intensive. He's an, uh, an institutional trader. He trades the large S&P, but he writes a lot of um, option premium. So he had uh, commented, just to share this with the group, Julia, just an observation regarding options expiration. Our fund was short calls that were assigned on Friday at 2100 and 2105. This resulted in a fairly large short position coming into the day. As a result, we had to buy to cover. This buying would not have occurred had we not been assigned the options. This yeah, goes to not, Jim's point. That was not for this expiration. That was for no, but expiration. in February. But the point right. is that these people, they're not getting in the market because they want, like John didn't want to buy. It's just that you, you're, you, you, you're assigned an option that, yeah, you have to to cover that position. So it's a forcing action of what we saw in the A period. I, I didn't mean to go off topic, but that's, okay. that's important to the option Friday, expiration. Friday too. was month-end expiration. I commented this morning that about 70% of the time lately we have seen that the market has been down on the last day of, the, 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 of monthly expiration. Now, keep in mind the assignments go out on Saturday. They can go out any time. But, you know, they, and people find out they come in today and they have to trade to adjust what they've been assigned uh, on either Friday or on, on Saturday on the expiration. So that is, as Julia just said, that has nothing to do with what they want to do. It's what they have to do. And that can be very important to understanding what's going on in the market. Yeah, Friday, and I just, okay, go ahead. The market was down big on Friday, and more than likely, because so many traders write premium, when the market started to break overnight on Friday and then traded off so heavily, there was probably an awful lot of trade in there related to trying to hedge the option positions. Right. So he, just, yeah, I just want to finish, John, just to round it out. He, he is saying this buying would not have occurred had we not been assigned the options. This goes to Jim's point that there are positions that are being established and closed based solely on options expiration as opposed to wanting to establish a new long position. Um, so it's just... Um, just to share that it's option. It's a factor of the market. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you what for your comment. Got? Okay. Um, do you do you want to relate anything to today's market? Because we have some questions about the 2078 cluster as it relates today's to today's trade around the 2097-98 area. Good. I, I want to talk about what I've talked about so far. 
So go ahead, the cluster would probably be relevant. Do you still consider 2078, le the level of 2078 as important going forward? Not nearly as, in not nearly as important as it was this morning. The only reason I would consider it now, because if we go back through 2078, that means all those people that had to cover cover their shorts today, uh, you know, they've now they've now gotten caught probably the other way. So it's not nearly as important as it was on Friday, but it's still not it's it's not uh, not a major reference, but it certainly is something that I will I will focus on. Okay, other couple of questions. Yes, what criteria do you use to consider that a level was accepted or not, if they are penetrated, or, you know, just if you could add a little to the acceptance concept? Once again, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see confidence. The market, will, the market will move with some aggressiveness through that level. For example, when we say this morning, you know, we're accepted, you know, we're way above value, we're accepted up here, but we got... Price is rejected out of Friday's range, and we're moving quickly into the gap. And this is the first time we're getting some acceptance within the gap. Down here, the market's being rejected. It's moving quickly to the upside. Now you're getting acceptance in, within the, uh, the gap from Friday. Once you get in the gap, the destination trades becomes the opposite extreme. Once you get there, the destination, next destination trade becomes the 29th level, which is a uh, very prominent point of control from last Thursday. Okay, another question. We got another question there. Uh, on mute. If a trend day with continuation, in contrast to, to Friday, where the mid morning um, went in balance for many uh, several hours, what is normally the number of periods to balance um, on a pullback? Um, would be considered simply an inventory adjustment, you know, before a resumption of trend. Julia, that... Julia gave a, a rough, a rough thought this morning. If you have a good trend day down, you, it's not necessarily balanced at a particularly thirty-minute high, but the, in a good trend day down, the, the the market doesn't generally get more than about four or five wide in any one place. And that was a good reference that she gave uh, this morning. Okay. Great. Do you consider today's B period low a weak low, having held just absolutely. a tick above? Absolutely, the absolutely. And I'm going to come to that in a minute. Okay. Uh, I, I deliberately have not talked about that yet. That's where I want to go next. I want uh, any other, and I will address that because it's great. Any other questions that appear to be pertinent to what I've already talked about in preparation for trading today, or why I thought the market was short coming into today? I know. It is. You got two more at least. I know it's a general question, but using this knowledge, do you still get faked out on the open? And how quote early do you mean um, off the five-minute bars? No, Jim doesn't use five-minute bars. Thirty-minute bars is the shortest time period increment. But um, you know, do, do you have anything to add to that in a general way, Jim? About it's, it's a it's 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 a feel. It, it, it is. You know, I, I will tell you that it's it's. First of all, if you do your preparation, if you already think the market is short, and that's why I was focusing on that very intently today, that I thought the market was short coming in. If the market is short, it's, the chances are pretty good that the market's going to move pretty early. And you're, if, you're wondering, if you see confidence, here's the opening. We always look at the opening for confidence. We open, we went a few ticks below the open, and then we started to trade higher. When you see this, you say, we're at the upper end of the range. We've got some confidence from the opening. We didn't go back and forth through the opening multiple times. If confidence is low, you will go back and forth through the opening multiple times. When you look at this morning, we, only, we went below the opening a couple of ticks, and then we were mostly to the upside. Confidence is high. That's a situation you need to go with right now. That is, a, that is when you trade. Remember, you're, out of ba you're, you're still within Friday's range, but you're out of balance relative to all of the trade, the heavy trade that took place on Friday. You're above this area where I said the stops were. And I said it's unlikely that those stops were covered in the overnight market. They more than likely you're going to have to cover in the pit session today. So okay. when we open and we go back and we don't go back and forth through the opening, go a little lower, go away, you want to get on that right away. 
Okay, another by question. The, by the time Friday closed, the settle was around the prominent point of control. Why would you say that Friday was too short? And if you split it or just look, Jim, split at the profile, um, a lot of those traders didn't cover at the settle. Um, you can't assume, and it really didn't. They really got them at the end of the day, and to think they all got out or it was it was balanced by remember, the close. Remember, no. they started selling overnight. You gapped Gap. lower. You yeah. sold all day long. They were selling every rally here for five periods. They sold it late in the day, and this pop late in the day, that certainly wasn't enough to cover all the shorts that took place when, this, when it started overnight, gapped higher, the, the single prints in A period, they were selling every rally in this last week. There wasn't even close to allowing all those shorts to cover. So the market appeared to be very short. And as we said, the 45-degree line, just because you go back to the 45-degree line, that doesn't allow them all to cover. It's still probably got an awful lot of people that are caught short, and it's exactly what we dealt with today. Okay? Okay. As today, well, this is coming into today. Hold on that with the question for today. Um, okay. I don't want to say your name. Um, also, do the prominent TPOs, uh, the prominent, maybe he means POC, lose their importance over time? For example, if they are, if it is penetrated to the upside or downside. On once their, they're revisited, once a prominent point of control is revisited, I exit out. But if it's not been revisited, I carry it forward until it's just clear that we're so far away from it, it's meaningless. Okay, I want to go take a look at this morning. And I, I want to show why this was not a surprise, what happened late in the day. I made a, I, um, captured a couple of other uh, slides today. Here is a capture that I took this morning at 11.35 Eastern Time. And somebody asked... Um, could you just make that a, a little larger, Jim, each slide one at a time? Like, just hold your control key down and scroll your wheel mouse. Just try and make it a little larger so we can see the text. Thank okay. you. Okay. Now, here's some things to, to keep in mind. I couldn't, I couldn't remember the exact price here. Um, this is the first capture I took. Early, in this, early this morning, the market pulled back to exactly half back. If you were on the mor this morning session, I commented that the market, it actually went one tick below half back. It looked above the overnight low, it came back to uh, one tick below half back, and then it started to rally. When a market rallies from exactly half back or within a tick of it, that is usually a sign it's short covering or it's trading, trading money. So I recorded that. The next thing I recorded was that the B period pullback low was to a single tick above the overnight high. When I see that, if somebody started to ask the question, that is an indication to me that I have weak buying. I have day time frame. I have the weakest of, peop of traders buying the market. Now, that doesn't mean that the market's not going higher, but it's the fact that it went to half back early and then a single tick below, oh, I'm sorry, a single tick above the overnight high is a, is a sign to me I have weak buying that lowers the odds of significant upside continuation in there. But remember, the market's short, and we said the market always has to take care of current business First, the current business is covering the short inventory because when market's short, there's margin calls, they have to be satisfied, the shorts have to, have to get out. So indication one, the first pullback was to a single tick above half back, it was a sign of weakness. The B period pullback was to a single tick above the overnight high, and this is all part of this information that I said, you know, I've really solidified in my mind in the last six to seven months and it's the biggest single advance in my, in my last 10 years of my trading. Now, as I took that capture, I also pointed out that the D period leaves a single, single print. So if D period comes down, it leaves a single print. Again, very mechanical. 
The first reference down here was very mechanical, half back. The second reference was very mechanical, exactly one tick above the um, overnight high. The third one I captured here was just a single tick. Now, who do you think is buying at these levels? This may be shorts, it may be daytime frame traders, but this is not long-term serious money. I always want to know who am I competing against in the market. So as I watched, as I watched this go, I'm sitting there saying, this is not a strong day. While price is going up and it's short covering, the tremendous amount of single prints I had early on is usually an indication of short covering rather or old business rather than new business. So I made this recording of, of this early on, as you say, 11.35 uh, Eastern Time. So at that point in time, I was pretty comfortable that I wasn't going to have a lot of follow through to the upside. Yet short term traders continued to buy this market. I took another capture at 12.45. This first one was taken at 11.35. This one was taken an hour and 10 minutes later at 12.45. One more time, notice that the high remains, the market comes down and it ticks exactly, exactly at that single print. One tick above the early high, who do you think is buying the market? Longer term, more serious money, they would, they have no idea where that is, nor would they, nor would they care. So at this point in time, I don't want anything to do with the long side of this market. I don't want anything to do with the long side of this market. I think it's weak. I think I only see short covering. Now, hold that thought because I, I made a comment earlier, and that comment was price advertises opportunity, volume measures, or time regulates all opportunities, and volume, time, price advertises opportunity, time regulates all opportunities, and volume measures the success or, or failure of the advertised opportunity. Those that have been with us know that we constantly look at volume. And I'm going to go back up and I've got it pulled up here. The first 30 minute volume was 345,000 contracts. Friday was 492. We know from watching this and people with us a long period of time, anytime you're down in the 320, 340 level, that's pretty low. To get anything really significant, you're in the, in the 450, 450, 500 plus level. So when I look at this, the first half hour volume this morning, 345, I know that is very light volume. Switch up here, total volume for the day was 2.9. And for people who want to know, we take this from the New York Stock Exchange composite volume. Uh, we do not use futures volume. And I read the composite volume because I find it's the best source. This um, is, excuse me, Jim, people are asking, this is the intensive site, okay? So it, this is more a secured site for the intensive content in the course. So go ahead, Jim, excuse me. Have... Okay. All right, so now I'm going back to today. Remember, I've already shown you the two captures. I've got indications that it is not a strong, it is not a strong market. I now support this with volume. I now support this, and the volume does not support the way this market's going up this morning. So I think what I've got is short, is short covering. I think I have old business, and I look at the mechanical nature of where those reference are. Half back, one tick above the overnight high in B period, and we left that single print for so long. So, one, I wanted nothing to do with being on the long side of the market, and what do you think I was doing late in the day? I was buying, I was buying puts, because I didn't think the odds of upside continuation were good. Okay, now, let's take that information, and let's prepare for, let's talk about what we would do to prepare for tomorrow. We've already seen the monthly, but there's going to be no change when we look at the monthly profile. That's not going to show us. Uh, monthly bar. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. We look at the monthly bar. There's going to be no change from what we saw earlier. There's going to be no real significant change in the weekly, but we are going to go and we'll take a very fast look at the weekly. Um, the weekly bar, just to be sure. 
Okay, here's the, um, there's the weekly bar, no real change. We're, uh, uh, we're within last week's bar, we still have this 10, 10 now going 11 week balance. Um, we're trading down, you know, down a little lower because this is on the uh, pit session. We're trading a little lower. We're about the middle of last week's range. No real change on that. So, and we're going to go to take a very fast look at the daily bar. We're going to be trading right down here about now. So we have no, we're 35, 36, we're in the middle of that. We have no real change on the monthly, weekly, or daily bars. So we look at that and we're about where we were when we looked at the, the uh, today, coming into today. So now, what do I do? Now I go down and I look at the profiles. When I start to, to put together a tactical plan for tomorrow, I come down and, and basically put the profile under a microscope to take a very close look at it. Now, when I look at the, when I look at the profile, I already know Attempted direction today was up. Attempted direction was up. I have the P formation, which is an indication of short covering. I don't have elongation. My volume was very low. So I have an indication that what I saw today was old business, not new business. Old business being short covering. Remember, short covering can actually weaken a market because short covering removes potential buying power from the market. So I go a little a little wider, okay? I still on the longer term profiles, I don't have any meaningful excess. I've got two back to back poor highs. That doesn't tell me much. Uh, I have a two tick selling tail today, but that's certainly nothing to write home about. There wasn't any aggressive selling up here. We got some liquidation you know, going on late in the day, but I didn't have any aggressive selling. I have a prominent point of control at the 2093.75 level. The more prominent point of control is, the higher the odds that we can trade back to it. So I've got to mark, I've got to mark um, that, I didn't get mark quite right. I've got to be aware of that very prominent point of control. I've got to be aware that's not a particularly good high up there today. Um, value was higher today. Now, I also have a very prominent point of control at the 2075 level uh, from last Friday. So that is a potential very prominent point of control level to be revisited. So I could trade down to here, get this revisited to, tomorrow. I could not have any further downside. I could trade back up here tomorrow. Both prominent points of control have high odds of being revisited. I don't really, again, remember when we looked at the, when we looked at the uh, daily bar, we were in this 35, 36 day trading range going nowhere. A lot of short term volatility, but we don't have anything significant on the long-term volatility. Now, do I have a chance for change tomorrow? Yes, I do. Attempted direction today was up. The market showed low volume, poor shape on the profile, a weak close, We're trading off a little bit now. So what would, what would be an indication of weakness tomorrow? An indication of weakness tomorrow would be that I open up and I stay my value is clearly below today's value. The value where it's low today is at the 2092 level. My value tomorrow is clearly lower. If I hit lower value, the destination trade is potentially going to be the early morning low this morning at the 2084 level. And then the next, the next downside destination target would be the 2075 level. So those would be kind of extremes on the downside if this market breaks. On the downside, if I get lower value tomorrow, remember I'm still in this really broad trading range for the last 35, 36 days. I'm going to focus on value. So if I'm trading down here, down below uh, the low of, yes, of uh, today's value, then I'm going to target down today's low and I'm going to next look at the overnight low. 
or I'm sorry, at the very prominent point of control from point. If I don't get downside follow through and value starts to build, you know, an overlap or back into today's value, now the chances are that I can trade back up and start to head towards the prominent point of control to 2098.75 level and then the potential of these two non-excess highs from last Wednesday and Thursday. Again, I don't have any indication of any high level of confidence in either direction. What I have today is attempted direction up, the market was weak, the shape was poor, but again, uh, I don't have any great excess on the high and I don't have any great elongation on the downside. More than likely I got some short covering today. The short, the, the short covering ran its course. Uh, short term traders got all excited about price moving higher. They jumped on, on board going with the short covering, not recognizing it was old business and then the market started to trade off and we got some late liquidation. So I don't have any great bias to either the long side or the short side going into tomorrow. I think I had liquidation late, but I don't think I had anything that showed me real new aggressive selling. So I'm fairly neutral coming into tomorrow. My focus will be on where does value develop relative to the low of today's value area. Okay, now I'll take a couple questions, but we're, we don't have a lot of time, but I do want to take a very fast look at um, Crude oil, I'm going to do this with profiles. You remember this morning, uh, we put up, we put crude up, um, and we talked about crude. We said there was a two-day balance. There was a two-day balance, and we said my real focus was the, the two-day balance. If we don't trade through the, uh, the, the low and the two-day balance, the balance trading rules, well, once we have the two-day balance, balance trading rules were in effect. Balance trading rules are we remain within balance, and because we were down in this area this morning, remaining within balance, would then, if we don't take a lot of balance, then the destination trade becomes the opposite end of value, balance. Guess where the market went? Almost to the top of the, what, the two-day balance, which is now a three-day balance. Okay? So it worked, the balance trading rule worked perfectly. That was, the we didn't, uh, we stayed within balance, we stayed within balance, the destination trade becomes the opposite extreme of the balance. Had we looked below balance, the next leg of the balance trading rules would look below and fail. If you look below and fail, came back in, the destination trade would become the opposite extreme. The third oh. rule of balance would be to look below the balance and then accelerate to the downside. Julia, you started to say something. Well, we were commenting this morning, too, that that was an inside bar on Friday's session. So depending on your risk, you know, and how aggressive a style you have, it looked below the inside bar, came back in, destination is the opposite side of range. And we talked about that, and it was only printing probably at 57.80 or something. So it did make the destination of the inside bar trade. Well, That's a trade made, as a day trader you almost have yeah, to do. Yep, absolutely. It made, well, it made, it made that. It, it traded outside of uh, uh, Friday's range, and it made almost a three-day high. Now, one of the things that's important in, when you're looking two at two-day high. Well, it was it, it traded oh, above almost today. to the, yes, almost gotcha. to the two-day high today. Almost got there, but we did not we did not complete the outside day. We had a chance for an outside day. We looked below Friday. We traded above it. We failed. It's only an outside day if it closes over there. The failure to hold above the outside day is generally a negative indication. So. It's still a three-day balance. That's where I am on crude coming into tomorrow. The next market we looked at this morning, we looked at um, we looked at crude oil. I'm sorry, we looked at gold. I looked at the bar chart. My comment was that these lows were awfully close together. Plus, you had an inside bar on Friday. So one, when I get these lows being so close together, I'm always aware of the possible firecracker effect which means these lows are taken out, which enough power that triggers the next low. Well, it only got two of them today, but the gap, the, uh, the gap trading rule was in effect. Go with all gaps that aren't filled immediately or fairly quickly. And um, so the gap did hold. The short-term auction has reversed. 
the destination trade is going to be down around the uh, the low at the uh, 1183.50. So the short-term auction is down, but it's still within a multi-day balance. All right, we've only got five minutes. I'm sorry we've we've got some time pressure today, but um, let's go ahead and take just a couple of questions, Julia. Okay, thank you, Jim. I'm just answering as many as I can on the keyboard here. Um, if the B period, well, there's a question here from uh, Minneapolis, Chicago, Link. Um, you know, the B period was a weak um, pullback, but it was also a good place to buy, correct? It, that is a wonderful question because this, yeah. again, comes down to what, what are you doing as a trader? And what, I, what I've said so many times. That is a legitimate place to buy. It is a short-term reference, even though it is a weak reference. Um, and we see those hold all the time for at least part of the day. And the reason, and here's the type of personality that can buy that reference. If you're going to buy that pullback at the top of the overnight range, your personality should be one, if it doesn't immediately rally, you're out. If your personality is one that if it doesn't rally immediately and it goes back in, you're going to sit and watch it and think about it for a while, then you can't be doing that trade. This trade can be done by a trader such as the person that asked this question is a professional trader. Uh, you can buy that. You can buy that as a short-term trade, but you have to be willing to give it up immediately. In this case, it worked. It worked and you got up and it, it one time framed higher for three time periods and it actually took it to the high for the day. But you also know that I call them here today, gone tomorrow. In other words, it's a good reference for the day time frame right now, but it is a poor reference going forward. So here today and gone tomorrow, as you can see, we've already traded down back below it. Also, and this is what makes trading complicated. You've got to know who you are, what you're trading. And we talked about we had a weak low here, half back, a weak low here, weak here. So the Make it a little were, bigger, Jim. I'm sorry to interrupt, just so if you're going to stay yeah, on it. Just it we were half back. This first pullback was half back, weak. One tick above the overnight high, weak. We left the single print up here that I showed for some period of time, sign of weakness. So we've got, it's what we call exponential. In other exponential. words. Exponential. Exponential. Oh, yeah, yeah. One 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 weak reference may be a coincidence, so I don't spend a lot of time focusing on it. Two, two weak references start to become very serious, and I give them an awful lot more um, respect. Three becomes almost overwhelming for me, and that's the point of time in which I said, I want nothing to do with the long side, I do want to see an opportunity on the short side. That is also that information that is, um, like I say, it's the newest thing in my trading arsenal and it has been very valuable for longer term trades. Hold on one second. I hope I got that muted in time. I'll yeah, you did. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, one or two more questions. Let's talk about the B period again. If the B period pullback was weak, what would be the opposite? If this weak pullback limited upside continuation, this is confusing. I would think that if it was bought above the overnight high, that would indicate that upside odds are decent. Lastly, since the single print and C period, I considered the upper portion a second distribution, and staying above that would support a possible higher move. Am I seeing this correctly? I don't think so. I think the three, I think it's too mechanical. I think the three Weak references I talked about overwhelm the double distribution. And, um, you know, like I say, this is the newest thing in my arsenal, and it's very, very powerful. It's the most powerful thing that I've come across, as I say, in, in 10 years. Because you really, what you really want to know, who are you competing against? And you want to know, you want to know if the inventory is getting into strong hands or weak hands. So at this point in time, if you're a really quick trader, you say, okay, I understand what they're doing. I think they may get them trouble, themselves in trouble, but it's probably not over right now. So you can go with that. And then later on, you can say, now I think they're really in trouble. And then you can turn around and go against that inventory. This, it's 
trading, trading is not simple. Remember, there's probably only a couple percent of the day traders make money. The trading, we can show you how to compete with the best of traders there, is, there are out there. But you have to understand this idea of time frames. So what is, what is positive for the short term time frame may actually be weakening the market for a longer time frame. For example, sh short covering rally is very powerful. They're great markets to trade. They move very quickly. You, you make your money very, very quickly. But overall, the next thing about those rallies is they weaken a market because they remove underlying buying power. So again, a good trader, a good trader can carry two conflicting thoughts in their mind at the same time. One, they say the short term is, is, is weak, but it's advancing, but it's setting up a trade for the next time frame. So they can see a positive and a negative at the same time. It's what I call positive cognitive dissonance. Most people get their, you know, hammered quite a bit because cognitive dissonance kills them. The really good traders can keep two conflicting thoughts in their mind and take advantage of both of them. Um, I'm going to sign off. Um, I'm sorry, usually we will run uh, longer and answer more questions, but we do have some commitments tonight. I want to thank you all very much for being here, and I do want to remind you of the, uh, of the intensive. The intensive starts on officially June 1st, but for those that sign up uh, early, I will start issuing, or we will start issuing two reports beginning May 1st, a recap and preparation report for the following day and an update in the morning. And uh, starting May 1st, we have a one-way chat comment. So I will make one-way chats throughout the, uh, the day. Julia, if you sign up, Julia will show you how to get logged into that. So you will see, I will make those chat comments as they come along. For example, today I would have made a chat comment based upon um, this um, the half back. I would have made a chat comment based upon the B period low. I would have made one on the single print up here. And the uh, multiple so that would have, highs too. Those would yeah, have been, so, they were getting in trouble. Yeah, yeah, you, um, would have seen, you would have yeah, seen several. You would have seen a lot. Anyhow. We log them and I copy them every day, so everything's archived on the site. If you are thinking about doing the intensive, May 1st, it's now it's $100 off before May 1st, so take advantage of that if you want in. Obviously, May 1st is a couple of weeks away, so no sweat, but... Um, if you have any questions about the intensive, don't hesitate to call us, and uh, we'll see if it works for you. It depends on where you're at with the profile and your own trading. Okay, everyone. Jim, thank you very much. Great presentation. Everyone, this recording will be up later tonight. i got to run, but at about 9 o'clock, 9.30, I'll have this uh, up there. Please look at the reports. Some of the questions you all asked, you can find them in the reports that are at the morning webinar. Um, and the slides from the morning webinar might help you a little as well with today. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. We had some great questions, so very much helps the presentation, makes it better. So thank you for your participation, and uh, have a great night. Our next webinar is on Wednesday, 1130 Eastern, to accommodate our European colleagues, uh, where their close is at 1130 a.m. Eastern. Um, so they're not up until 9 at night, 10 at night, watching these webinars. So uh, see us back here in a couple of days if you can. All right, and thank you, everyone, very much. And Mr. Dalton, thank you very much, sir. Great job. Julia, and thank you, and thank everyone else. Thank you, guys.